The Imperial Navy. Welcome, gentle listener. I am Baldemort, your faithful servant, and I wish to introduce you to the factions, faces, and forces of the Warhammer 40k setting, the grim darkness of the far future, where there is no time for peace, there is only time for war. We also have channels for mythology and natural history, links in the description. So like, subscribe, and throw me a coin if you enjoy the video more than usual, or patron, of course. Now, before we proceed, a brief advert. To help fund a house move, I'm afraid. Sorry about that. Raid Shadow Legends, where you too can be a legend. Raid has been a constant support to the channel through tough times, so throw the ball to bone, and why not get stuck in? Go on, scan the thingy, the techno thingy, and you will not regret it. Raid is the premier mobile game and earns the title, with fast-paced action and mechanics that allow for solo or team play through the clan mechanic, you will not be alone. And it contains in-game material, such as facing off against the Hydra, now in competitive clan mode, so it's time to lay the smack down on this snake with your homies. It really is a phenomenon that millions are already playing frequently and regularly, because it's so easy to pick up, but so hard to put down. And if you join today, you will gain a veritable Cardinal of Whoopass for free. Talia of the Sacred Order, plus 200,000 silver, 4 energy refills, an epic skill tome, and an XP booster. But more! You can also access the Stag Knight, with a skin designed for him by John Tron himself. Just use the promo code JTSKIN before October the 7th. Easy. Just scan the techno thingy or hit the links in the description. Raid Shadow Legends. Start your legend today. And now let us move on. Now usually I would tell a story in this segment, but unfortunately I still have the tail end of COVID, which is probably why things may be a little bit more scatty than usual. I apologize for that. But I had a burning urge to do this video today. I don't know why. Perhaps it is because it is our fourth anniversary. And I do adore the fleet. I don't know as much about them as I should, and I will rectify that very soon. So let us do this, an introduction to the merest concepts of the Imperial Navy. Now, let us talk about scale, size, and please do just shut your eyes and think, dream, imagine them all, for my words are merely the doorway into your imagination. I want you to, just this once, not just listen and nod, or use this as a mere sleeping prop, but to take just a few moments out to truly imagine, to dream, to visualize that which I am about to tell you. Alas, I am no man of science, though I find it fascinating. This is just the result of even basic investigation, so please do follow up and expand your knowledge even further. But I myself was staggered. For things have moved on so much in so many arenas. If you leave it for but one decade, the things you once believed completely are now dwarfed by the progress that has occurred in near any discipline. When I was growing up, the universe seemed so much smaller, for we did not have Hubble and other incredibly powerful telescopes. So, then, I was right. The universe, according to our Ken, was indeed much more compact then to the basic everyday man, like myself. Yet now, the numbers, the scope of it all, it can be suffocating. It can make one feel insignificant. Yet please remember, in all of this, you are unique. Nobody will ever be the same as you. Think like you, feel like you, and experience what you have, when you have, in the period you have. So just hold that tight, and do not be overshadowed by the immensity of what I will impart, for you are star in this universe, and never forget it. So, space, the void. From what we can directly discern, at this present moment, there should be at least 170 to 200 billion galaxies in our range of enhanced detection or current visibility. Yet past where we can discern, there may be up to, or even beyond, two trillion galaxies. 
Yes, you had that right. Two trillion. Not planets, not systems, but galaxies. Each galaxy is between 1,000 to 100,000 parsecs in diameter, being approximately three to 300,000 light years across. Those spiral patterns in the skies are indeed galaxies. Some much larger, a few smaller, but many of a size with our own, the Milky Way. In the void between each of these galaxies are up to millions of parsecs, called megaparsecs. Imagine that just for a moment, the sheer vastness of the void, almost infinite, always expanding. Into what? Well, I shall allow you to explore that for yourselves. Yet this is the grand canvas, so I can show that the numbers we are about to discuss about our own place of origin seem less unrealistic. In comparison, they are rather small, yet vast almost beyond human conception. Hence I ask you to imagine, to dream, to leave cognition behind, and permit your spirit itself to feel its way through this labyrinth of mind-scrambling yet expanding knowledge. Now so commonplace, yet not all are aware. For some do not conceive it as relevant, but I assure you it is. For we are a part of this glory. Now let us explore our own galaxy, the Milky Way. For in this, our very backyard, so to put it, there are between 100 and 400 billion stars. Of course, the specific numbers are highly conjectural, and debated, yet there are likely to be planets around the majority, if not all, of these stars. Although it is almost unfeasible to imagine that all of these stars have habitable worlds around them, that still means that the Milky Way galaxy is 100 to 400 thousand times larger than the imperial worlds that are claimed. But this is not what we are led to believe in the grim darkness of the far future. For in this setting, it is stated that there are a million worlds in the Imperium. This is just an estimation, a nice figure to round things out, for none truly know how large it is, not even the High Lords of Terror. Yet the Imperium is stated to sprawl from one end of the galaxy to near the other. There are the fringes, where the galaxy is beyond the light of the Astronomicon, but the majority is proclaimed to be under the thrall of humanity. Yet this is not actually true, not nearly. For there are vast orc empires, Necron holdings expanding, worlds annihilated by the Great Devourer, the Tyranid Hive fleets, and all of this is within the supposed control of the galaxy commanding Imperium. Nor are the numbers correct by a huge gulf. Is it that those writing the setting were utterly ignorant of the real scope of the galaxy? Well, yes and no. Yes, as in one million worlds sounds almost impossibly large, so it would be used as a benchmark of size in those days of the last century, so it could have been sheerly not knowing. Yet there is another way of looking at things. Yes, the numbers we are now used to hearing are far more expansive than those days, as our collective knowledge as a race has expanded. But it is also, in my humble opinion only, a way to allow for wiggle room. For the reality is that the Imperium is entirely controlled and its course of expansion directed by the warp lanes and Mandeville points of the warp. When a starship of the Imperium goes into the warp, there are places that appear as well-trodden paths with gates into reality that are ancient and specific, the Mandeville point of a system. Yet this beggars the question what happens with worlds that are without such lanes? And this does indeed seem to be the vast majority if the Imperium is a mere million systems. For if there is no warp lane and Mandeville point to take the ship to and then release into real space, then it can still be done, it can still be visited. Ships can still travel to these stars and worlds, but they must then either take the long haul of sublight travel or must guesstimate where they are in the warp, something that navigators do not consider prudent. This means that if a world is off the grid, so to put it, 
then how would one even know what was happening to the exploratory fleet that may have sojourned out to it? For communication is performed through the warp and warp lanes via astropathic choirs, or taken in person aboard ships. But if using sublight speed engines, then it would take thousands of years to reach their destination. And by this token, it would take thousands of years to then get out a message of any form whatsoever. Hence, the majority of the Milky Way galaxy, despite the claims of the Imperium, is entirely uncharted. For all we know, there are literally millions of systems under the control of orcs, hrad, or worse, out there. Perhaps the cybernetic war was not lost by the forces of artificial intelligence. Perhaps they merely hopped over to the worlds not on the warp planes, and by that dint would practically disappear. Perhaps the Slot or even the Rangdan sit behind this veil in the same galaxy yet growing and preparing a host of ships and forces that will dwarf even that of the Great Crusade. Perhaps there is evil or order that exists in numbers and with power that will swat the Imperium of Man should it ever merely deign to transfer its existence into the worlds that are fought over so much by the younger races. The Necrons do not use warp lanes at all. So could the Necron threat be the tip of the iceberg alone? the majority of their forces awakening on worlds that will never, ever be discerned by the Imperium. Food for thought indeed. But why, O oh follically challenged one, are you talking about this so much when the topic of the day is the Imperial fleet? One simple reason. To explain what the Navy must be aware of at all points. For they are not alone, and threats can come out of literally nowhere for the dispositions of the Imperial fleet can seem nonsensical to some. Surely, the Navy should be almost exclusively stationed around the front, where they are needed most. The tear across the universe, Gork and Mork's grin, where the rent caused by Abaddon the Despoiler in his 13th Black Crusade broke through. The line across the galaxy that is like the Eye of Terror, where the warp bleeds directly into the realm of reality. From where armadas of chaos traitor ships erupt on a near daily basis. Surely, these places should be where the bulk of the fleet muster, ready to push back the chaos filth wherever it rears its despicable head. Yet, this is not so. The Indomitus Crusade fleets are vast collections of ships, and yes, indeed, they do indeed sally forth to cut the head from the enemy's snake to confront chaos and reclaim systems as they go. But the majority of the Imperial fleet is broken down into sectors and subsectors with standing fleets. It is all due to this scale. It is because they really do not know where an enemy will come from, where or even how. The pirates of humanity alone can cripple entire regions and starve populations. Yet this danger is magnified by the deft and nimble fleets of the Eldar Corsairs. Once, before the Imperium, before the Crusade, before the Eldar Fall from Grace, the Corsair fleets were the Eldar Navy, ships and groups far enough away from the Eldar Core worlds that they were not consumed by Slanesh upon her awakening. They are disciplined, organized, and deeply able. Again, the Orc freebooter fleets that randomly rush across a galaxy, gaining speed and momentum as they go. If not checked early, they can develop into full-blown wars, and this is never a good thing for the Imperium. With Thrud migrations, anomalous minor empires, either of breakaway clusters of stars occupied by humans, or from Xenos races that have either returned or have evolved or developed into a threat like the Tau, let alone with the chaotic nature of the appearance of traitor fleets. It has proven impossible for the Imperium to defend its holdings unless they use a careful disposition of their forces. For what point is there in taking the war to the enemy if they are burning everything behind your lines? Ergo, the fleet is widespread and locally led, for the most part anyway. 
there are rare occurrences, dire threats, that might lead to a mobilization on a segmentum basis. But these are incredibly rare. Or at least, for the last 10,000 years, this has been so. But with the Necron Tyranid and Orc threat now escalating to a level never before witnessed by the Imperium, it is becoming all too frequent. Sometimes conquest is so much easier than holding a region, as it has always been, one might surmise. Yet now, it is more vital than ever, for the Imperium has always been able to win the vast majority of its wars via attrition. And one cannot maintain the output required for this style of combat unless you hold on to your means of production, not only of the materials of war, but also those able to wage it. For the Great Devourer converts all it consumes into warriors for the next war. The Necrons can enslave any population they dominate to such an extent that they can either use them as cannon fodder, using mind-shackling creatures, or even make them undergo biotransference, at least in older lore. The loss of ground will make further losses all the more likely. The Imperium has only one true option. To fight for every last world, star, and system. Or they will shrink into nothing and be consumed for it too. Now many will confidently state, as they should, that a true gift of humanity is innovation. We should progress and develop new technologies that will counter these threats. The skill that there must be amongst us such a mind-bogglingly large collection of Homo sapiens. Alas, as I will explain in my entry for the Adeptus Mechanicus this fall, it is not that simple. For the Lords of Technology, the Priesthood of Mars and all Forge Worlds have a complete monopoly of not only the maintenance of all machinery, but also all information that could lead to innovation. And the priests of Mars are so far from even understanding most of that which they zealously and jealously protect, their technology, that they burn all who question them, any who perform what they deem tech heresy. And that is anything whatsoever that does not come from the past achievements of our people. If it is not rediscovered knowledge from the dark age of technology, when humanity was at its cultural and scientific zenith, well, it is classed as an abomination, one that should be put down with extreme prejudice. To even ask why something works the way it does could lead to the question of being hurled into a forge fire. People do not seem to be so enamored of exploring new potentials, and as such, they cannot usually move forward in any way whatsoever, cannot develop new answers to new threats. The only exception to this being the arch dominus Call, of course. But we shall get to him another time. This also means that, for a million small and deeply human reasons, the level of technology is regressing. And so, older ships, which in any other setting or reality, especially our own current era, would be less and less valuable as time goes by. Refits and modifications would usually be performed on older craft to bring them back up to scratch and be more competitive with their enemies. This is the usual way. But in the Imperium, in the grim darkness of the far future, this is not the case. For the older ships will have more efficient drives, better weapons, better shielding and resource management. The newer the vessel is, usually, the weaker it is. Now, there are exceptions to this rule, of course. I can imagine many will pipe up with their own pet exception, and I indeed hope that those listening will share their knowledge in the comments section. But it is the exception that generally proves the rule. Now, how long this will continue is anyone's guess. As each of the Primarchs return to the Imperium, it is less and less likely that the technological stagnation will be permitted to continue as so many of these sons of the Emperor were artisans and builders, not only of weapons of war, but in all ways. So perhaps the entire setting will be overthrown soon, and a bright new dawn of progress returned. But in my humble opinion again, this will be a fundamental shift in the very DNA of the setting, and, 
But as people like to push things forward to their own tastes and dreams, often their mutation will lead to losing that which made a story unique and compelling. A difficult tightrope to walk. Let us hope that it is done with care and love for that which is, not taken for granted and thus wasted in the furore to please all. That is never possible, so only a fool would try. But let us move on. Hence we know why the fleets are stationed where they are, and why they operate the way they do on a strategic and logistic level. We shall get to the tactical and forced disposition soon enough. So, now, we get to the bones of the issue. How should one think of the Imperial Navy and all space combat in the grim darkness of the far future? Now I have to state immediately that there are many interpretations of this vision, as there are many authors, visual artists, fans and animators who all have visions that are equally valid. To some, it is a fast-paced whirligig of a frantic fray, akin to a fighter battle of Star Wars, where capital ships thump at each other and huge gouts of fire erupt from a vessel as it is torn apart in moments. The fighter is able to hit key locations and eradicate the entire officer staff. But to others, it is more like a slow, suffocating U-boat battle, more akin to the original series of Star Trek. But of course, it is one that is punctuated by flashes of mind-crushing violence and carnage. The positioning and approaches of these fleets take not moments, but hours or even days. The battles are akin to ballets to the more advanced or tactically astute races, a destruction derby to the more forthright or brutal races. For me, the imagery and description I have loved the most were that of a darkly romantic era of sail. So, I choose the latter. The ships are huge communities in space, where hundreds of thousands or even millions of men, women and children live and die under the flag of the Navy. And the ship's design and structure, the way they engage, is more akin to a hornblower novel, where huge ships of the line are designated by how many guns they had, and if they were a first, second or third ship of the line. Massive monsters of vessels that do not annihilate each other in a single or even repeated salvos. They do damage, of course, but rarely sink each other easily. And then there is always the option of the larger or more aggressive ship crew to then approach and even board the enemy. One imagines visions of pirates and redcoats using grappling lines and swinging ropes to board, and then mad sword and spittle coast quarters duels break out across the entire deck. And if you saw this in your mind, you are not far from the truth. For the battleships, grand cruisers, light and heavy cruisers, frigates and destroyers of maritime martial might are all too well transposed to the Imperial Navy of the 41st millennium. Each has its place in the line of battle, and this imagery goes so much deeper than one might imagine for such a futuristic setting. For we all forget sometimes what machines do even for us today in the third millennium. Now imagine that with winches and pulleys, sheer sweat broken from a hundred bent backs, that weapons are turned and their elevation altered, these weapons are so vast. They are reloaded to the beat of a drum and the orchestrated synchronous activity of families and clans who were born and grew, then finally took their ancestral job of merely being the muscle for a simple activity we would expect to be done at the flick of a switch. Some ships are more advanced, older ones, but some are as basic as one can imagine. And this is the confusing juxtaposition of the incredibly advanced weaponry that has been maintained being operated by people who can no longer understand why they work. And like Stone Age man, they do everything via muscle and exertion. That humanity, through the Adeptus Mechanicus, can still mass-produce ships of the line. Yet they do not truly understand how any of the technology jigsaw pieces all fit together anymore. Much less why... They use standard template constructs, plans from the Dark Age of Technology, as it is called by the Imperium. Now there are quite a few fleets in space. Many have different methods of propulsion, 
weaponry, and their approach to war. Yet they too generally conform to a version of this feel of the Age of Sail. The Eldar are more like swift cutters, who dip in and out of range at a speed almost impossible for the Imperial Navy to match. The Necrons can teleport and gain tactical advantages. The Tyranids are sheer clouds of ships that attack in waves. Yet the feel can remain, if the description is done with care. The Imperial Navy has been many things, but subtle is not one of them. They are very much modelled on the British Navy when it ruled the waves, as it was said. The largest of the ships, the ones who can sustain the most damage, but also dish out entire barrages, is called a capital ship, or ship of the line. These ships are then usually supported by escort craft, in the form of frigates and destroyers. Now imagine, if you can, that the smallest of these ships, the destroyer, starts at about 750 meters long, reaching to over, sometimes, 1.5 kilometers long. That's right, kilometers. These are the smallest combat ships of the Imperial Navy. The cruisers come in many forms as well, but usually start at about five kilometers. And the battleships? Well, they start at six, arranged to eight kilometers and more. There are larger vessels, like the Phalanx, and some of the old Gloriana-class ships, possibly ironclads, but not many. Hence, when you think of the Navy, think not in terms of thousands, but hundreds of thousands to many millions of crew the citizens of the void craft on which they sail. The loss of a squadron of ships is a misery. The loss of a flotilla, a calamity. The loss of a fleet, unthinkable, uncountenanceable. Especially those ships that are of incredible antiquity, those are often the most powerful due to it. So the Imperial Navy has a strange set of mandates indeed. Concurrent drives, that are utterly at odds. For the very nature of this much slower, a more slogging and sinister void war is something that can take a very long time indeed. A fleet must come through the Mandeville Point, which is in many cases at the outskirts of the system, then use their huge plasma sublight engines to approach the region of the system they need to be in. This can take days, or even weeks in some cases, depending on the size of the system. If the foe see them coming, which they will, then they have every opportunity to clear out. They can head around the fleet for the Mandeville Point and sod off into the warp, and off they go. They can play hide-and-seek in the many asteroid fields or around other celestial bodies, planets, moons, and the like, so that they can drag out a situation for weeks or even more. They can then return to wherever they were bombing into oblivion, subjugating or extorting from orbit as soon as the Imperial Navy ships leave. For leave, they always must. There are so many calls for assistance across any sector. The prolonged engagements are to be voided at all costs. Well, nearly all. And it is in the nature of the Imperial fleet to want to get in close to their opponents and crush them in one drawn-out decisive battle, rather than elegant intelligent clashes, for they need to resolve the issue immediately and then remove themselves. And here is where the conflict is highlighted best. The Imperial Navy likes up close, nasty and final. Yet they do not, cannot, truly risk some of their best ships. It is only the skill and cunning, experience and dedication of the Imperial officers that permits them to walk this razor's edge. And you had best believe that their officers are some of the best humanity has ever produced. But we shall get into that in another video. Now, to the general design ethos of the Imperial fleet. It's design dogma. For I hope that you may have seen the visual prompts in this video or at least are aware of how they look, should you be using this as noise alone. But the designs you see or know are not purely aesthetic in their nature, 
Oh, no. Those are very accurate depictions of exactly what these ships are. One has only to look at them to know on a visceral, feral, instinctive level exactly what they do. And it is not genteel, refined, or subtle. The majority of capital ships of the Imperial fleet have a massive prow on the front of their ships. This is no fashion statement. It is a weapon of war. For these prows will have many feet, sometimes ranging into hundreds of feet of armor. This is for two reasons. The first is because the Imperial fleet, like its British naval equivalent, will form a line and then plow through space towards the enemy. The front armor is for when the void shields may crack and then not cycle up on time, rare as this is. It allows Imperial ships to sustain brutal amounts of damage before being truly affected, let alone crippled or destroyed. While the Imperial ships close with the enemy, they will launch huge torpedoes like missiles into the void. Now, more often than not, they will miss. But with huge proximity blasts being able to be unleashed from them, a direct hit is not always required. But when one of these massive missiles does hit, it does damage on a level that terrestrial combatants would not dream possible. They are more often than not used to fire above, below, port or starboard of the approaching or defending enemy ships. They are used to cut off the enemy and funnel them towards the Imperial fleet. For this is where the second use of this massive prow comes in. If the enemy survive the front-facing torpedoes and lance fire of the lead ship or ships, then the prow is used as it was in the aquatic days. They ram the enemy. For there are a few ships in space that are as robustly constructed as those of humanity, and had it been the end of many a Xenos crew and vessel entire when they played chicken with an Imperial cruiser or above, for they merely speed up and crash through the opponent with ease, and then the true hell of the navy is unleashed. For the middle, elongated segment of each ship of any substance has a range of macro cannon batteries there, and they do just as one would expect. They fire rolling broadsides into their enemy, one gun after another firing down the line, so as not to throw the firing vessel off course through recoil alone. For any one of these cannons can be the size of a tower block, a weapon that most cities would consider a cultural and technological colossus. And the Imperial Navy have entire banks of them on their ships. Again, as with ships of the Pirate Age, yo-ho-ho, -ho, the fire from these ships at close range is able to tear through most ships across their entire axis, and many will not survive this event. Alas, where the Imperial Navy fights ships of its own caliber and design, like Chaos Traitor ships of the line, then engagements can go on for hours or even days if cunning maneuvering is performed as with the ships of the Spanish Armada versus their English counterparts. They may well fire into each other all day and blow huge gouts out of their sides, but rarely is a ship sunk in these engagements, not unless it is cut off from its allies, surrounded, and then pounded remorselessly. So too is it with the larger capital ships of the Navy when fighting their own kind. It is a drawn-out and horrific type of war, that leaves only those on the bridges of the ships truly aware of events being played out. Entire generations of families will huddle in the lowest decks while the armsmen prepare to board or be boarded. The gunners reload and fire, reload and fire. The engines are upkept and tortured for more power by the resident tech priests of Mars, and none truly know how well or badly they have done. One can guess, of course, if you are not sustaining hits that make the entire ship judder as if it were about to fall apart, if you have vantage to see out a window, and somehow the enemy are close enough to witness, and all is on fire apart from your own ship, yes, then perhaps one can know that you are winning. 
but this is rare indeed. Most of the crew, the very citizens of these vast craft, only know if they have won when they are told to stand down, or they witness their ship being destroyed, or, lastly, and this is all too common when fighting many opponents, the first they know that things are lost is when a traitor chain axe wielding cultist or even a starty space marine is slaughtering its way through them. But to those of the officers on the bridge or at strategic points in some ships, it is a desperate battle between two tribes, and the only result possible is the death of one or the other. The Imperial Navy may seem like a blunt instrument, and perhaps I should denote more time to declaring all of their tactics that I know at this present moment, but in reality, I shall be displaying some of this in my ongoing narrative works again soon, so wish to move on a bit. If you do wish to see what a battle is, according to me at least, with my limited skills, then go watch my videos on Abundance Tertius. I can assure you, there will be much more fleet action in the future. The near future. So, let us push on. There are many weapons that adjust this style, or more to put it, they supplement it. Some ships have Nova cannons, some have huge hangars filled with the attack craft the Navy used for void conflicts. In these cases, those flotillas or fleet assets that contain these weapons may be more likely to be at longer range, punishing the enemy before they close at the very least. Now the capital ships especially, but near all combat vessels of the Imperium have what are called void shields. The ubiquitous invisible egg of power around any ship that is seen in so many science fiction settings. Yet the void shields of the Imperium are, as usual, a little different, a little more interesting, because they are not just barriers of a sort of hardened energy. So just for fun and old times sake, for the very basics, let us lean on existing wisdom. To quote, Void Shields A void shield is a special form of energy field employed by the Imperium of Man's various military forces to protect void ships and super-heavy vehicles like Imperial Titans from enemy attacks. Void Shields use Imperial warp-based technology to both power the shields and then displace ranged attacks by subtly distorting the localized space-time around the point of impact. It is unclear whether void shields neutralize the incoming projectile or direct energy beam in real space through the manipulation of gravitic or other physical forces, transporting it directly into the warp or whether some other method is deployed to displace the damaging force of a physical attack upon the vehicle or vessel. Void shields seem to be able to be penetrated in some instances if an incoming projectile is moving below a certain minimum speed. Imperial void shields act in the same manner as orc custom force fields, though orc energy fields, like all green skin technology, are far less reliable and tend to be inoperable by other intelligent species without access to the gestalt wa energy once downed. Inversely, Imperial Void Shields can be reactivated after being collapsed, even during battle. In Void Combat, Void Shields do not protect from close combat assault or other vehicles moving through them to then attack the shielded vehicle or vessel. Void Shield Generators can be used to protect a planet-side military installation as well. Such shields are also used by Imperial military and civilian Void Ships to survive the hostile environment that is the vacuum of space. Shields form an invisible band of energy around the vessel, a variable layer of force that can absorb radiation, interstellar dust, and particle showers as well as weapon hits. Void shields have a maximum tolerance and can be overloaded by sustained weapons fire or massive collisions, forcing the generators to shut down temporarily to vent the excess kinetic or direct energy leaving the ship's unprotected hull open to attack. On ships with multiple void shields or void shield banks, it has been said that the void shields must be calibrated to overlap perfectly, or weak spots can occur. These chinks in the shields appear to be undetectable to anything but direct visuals, 
and can cause catastrophic void shield bank failure when shot at by titan-sized weapons or capital ship weapons. Void shields are also said to whine audibly when active and fizzle against one another when touching or overlapping. Notable Void Shield Variants The Triple Void Shield Array The ancient Grand Cruisers occasionally still operated by the Imperial Navy and certain fabulously wealthy rogue trader dynasties possess titanic layered banks of antiquated void shields that fill cavernous field decks the size of small towns. These are hellish compartments, rank with the stench of ozone and prone to unpredictably deadly arcs of lightning from copper discharge points as the onion-layered void shields are pounded by enemy ordnance. Grand cruisers are capable of mounting triple layers of void shields, making them more durable than all but battleships. The Reflex Shield A reflex shield is an ancient variant of void shield technology that were used by the starships of the Raven Guard Legion as a cloaking device to protect them from detection by enemy sensors and even the naked eye. The reflex shield technology was developed as a notable feature of the Shadow of the Emperor, the Raven Guard Legion's flagship during the Great Crusade and Horus Heresy. End quote. <laughs> well, that was jolly. Now pushing on to the organization of the fleet. The fleet is broken into five administrative zones. The Segmentum Obscurus, to the galactic north of Terra, based out of Cypra Mundi. The Segmentum Ultima, to the galactic east of Terra, based out of Cardunesh. The Segmentum Tempestus, to the galactic south, based out of Barkar. The Segmentum Pacificus, to the galactic west of Terra, based out of Hydrapur. Finally, there is the battle fleet of the Segmentum Solar, based out of the Iron Ring of Mars itself. Battlefleet Solar is the most prestigious and thus powerful of all the regions. It's the final step on most careers that lead to being on the High Lords of Terra, representing the Navy entire. Each of these regions are made up of sectors and subsectors with their own standing fleets, and it is stated that the core of most sector fleets is between 50 and 75 capital ships. So that many cruisers and battleships as the core. The escorts can be in the many hundreds to support such a collection of ships of the line. Yet, when we remember that each escort is often a kilometer itself, it gives you the scale of a massed fleet-sized action. Now it would be exceptionally rare for the entire congregation to be called upon to fight the one battle, it would take an existential threat to the region to permit this. For each ship taken into such a mammoth armada would then be drawn away from its regional patrols, unable to counter invasions, pirates, xenos, or emergencies of any form. They would not be able to protect the trade convoys that allow food and resources to travel from one system to another. The Imperium is a massive entity, and many of its worlds are utterly specialized. So an agrarian world a farm world may well feed many, many worlds in its near orbit. If trade and resource allocation ends, then that region will starve, then stagnate. Hence, any large-scale engagement often comes at the cost of countless worlds being gnawed away by opportunistic enemies. It has been calculated by more than a few people, very smart people, that the numbers involved in the Imperial Navy are indeed staggering. Yet with the amount of space that they have to defend, it is, in reality, not nearly enough. And the Navy is also probably the most important of all. For each world or system is akin to an island in the dark of the void, detached and alone. And when you are an island, then the Navy is a senior service. And this is the same in the Imperium. It may not be acknowledged at councils, especially those of war, but even the Inquisition think twice about interfering or attempting to commandeer a combat vessel. And what point is the Aster Miratarum, the Imperial Guard, without transit? How effective in a distant war are the Scions, the Knights, or even Titans, without transport to take them to the fray? For the history of the Navy is surprisingly simple. Well, it is to me today, at the very least. 
when the Emperor burst from holy terror, he first moved on Mars. He offered them near unlimited autonomy, unbelievable at the time. Swore that his great crusade would find many a scattered forge world out in the distant stars, and that automatically these would be considered the possession of the Mechanicum when met. Hence, their Mechanicum created the fleets and knights and titans that would be required to transport and assist the legions of space marines to conquer the galaxy. But then, the fleet was subservient to the Emperor, of course, but also the Primarchs and other regional lords of the Solar Auxilia. When the Horus Heresy ended, when the scouring had run its course, Rebute Gilliman reconstructed every wing of the Imperial War Machine, and he broke them apart. Regiments of Imperial Army were not to be mixed arms anymore. The artillery were cut from the cavalry, were separated from the infantry, etc., etc. The legions were broken up into chapters, and the navy was unlashed from the all. No longer could a general order them to give his forces transport. By breaking all of these wings apart, some might state that this created more levels of bureaucracy, more delays on activity, as men of equal rank but in different organizations would need to haggle or appeal to higher powers to force a cohesive response to any attack. Yet this was all done to limit the power of any one leader, be they Primarch, Warmaster, or Regional General or Admiral. None would hold so much power as they could wage war alone. None could amass such loyalty from their forces as they would ever be tempted to mimic Sulla and march on Rome. None would have the power to challenge the Golden Throne and the High Lords ever again. So the Navy has been given the most powerful position in many regards, for surely they absorb the greatest amount of resources in both materials, rare technology, and even in manpower, some might contend. But I think the Administratum and even the Ecclesiarchy may have something to say about that. But all this aside, the cost of the fleet to maintain is eye-watering. Yet without this expense, the other assets are utterly redundant. There is only one force that does not rely on the ships of the Navy, and that is the Angels of Death, the chapters of the Space Marines. They have their own strike cruisers and battle barges, a provided escorts as they require. Yet even these doughty warriors will call upon the assistance of the Navy when required. The Astartes fleets are lethal, but this is often due to the weapons they carry, the Astartes. For boarding pods, firing space marines into confined quarters on an enemy vessel is often the last thing they see before being torn apart by chainswords and bolters. Few things in the universe can match the marines in these conditions. Very few indeed. But where an enemy may need encouragement to close, to avoid fire, or to be a lame duck to act as bait, the Astartes will call upon their fleet allies when necessary. The Navy is where the true firepower is, the true versatility. And in the direst circumstances, where they do not require to fight, it is a fool of a chapter master who believes he can take his naval opponents lightly. Now I feel that we have the general gist of the fleet. I shall wrap this one up. For I think the ship classes and officer ranks, the terrible weapons they use, should be covered in the videos of the future. And if I am honest, I would really like to do much more reading before going into more of these ships. They are more interesting than one might initially think, and I would not want to sell even one of them short. And I hope you will join me then. I have been Baldemort, your faithful servant. A huge thanks to Raid sponsoring this video, so do check the links in the description and get stuck in. And you will also, in the description, find links to our mythology channel, which is presently doing the tail end of Greek mythology, but soon moving into the Norse sagas of the Asia and the Vanir. So, if you like Thor or Loki, Odin or Wotan, go subscribe, as the tales of their people are on the way in autumn. Now, no matter what you do today, do try to make some time for fun. Tulu.